Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will be discussing sexual and reproductive health services with special guests. Jennifer Welsh, President and CEO of Planned Parenthood of Illinois. Vicki Cohort, CEO of Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains. And Melissa Reed, President and CEO of Planned Parenthood Keystone. So thank you all for joining us. It's just great to, to, uh, to see you. Uh, and just to sort of to set this discussion up, Planned Parenthood was founded an astonishing 105 years ago in Brooklyn, and is today one of the nation's largest healthcare providers and education organizations annually offering support to over four and a half million people of all ages, genders, and identities, regardless of income, immigration, or insurance status. What a mission. Let's delve into uh, Planned Parenthood services and who provides those services. And let's start with you, Jennifer. What kind of services do you provide? How do you help uh, people throughout Illinois? Thanks for having me, Mark, and thanks for asking. Planned Parenthood of Illinois served 60,000 patients last year, and we provide comprehensive reproductive sexual health services. That can be anything from helping folks access birth control to STI and UTI testing and treatment, HIV prevention, gender affirming hormone therapy. We really offer a wide range of services. And like you said, our goal is to make sure that people get the care they need, no matter where they live, whether they have insurance, how much money they make. And STIs, uh, sexually transmitted infections, STDs, uh, sexually transmitted disease. So basically, you serve everyone who might come in, might walk through your doors with questions about uh, uh, reproductive pr uh, practices, uh, birth control, um, any uh, of a number of different conditions. Um, uh, you do uh, breast cancer screenings. You do a whole range of different services, right? We really do. And I think that people might not realize over 10% of the patients that we serve at Planned Parenthood of Illinois identify as male. So we have, we serve both male and female patients. And we also have staff trained to serve LGBTQIA patients as well. And Vicki, when, when you're serving your uh, constituents, um, you cover a really vast geography. You cover uh, three states, um, and those states are, are very different in terms of, of, uh, of ethnic backgrounds, of circumstance. You have a vast rural tracts, and then you have urban centers. How does that affect the constellation of services and how you organize, um, how you construct your staff uh, through this vast region? Well, that's a that's a really insightful question um, because and it's actually four states that we're responsible for: Colorado, New Mexico, the southern portion of Nevada around Las Vegas, and also Wyoming, and and we serve them each slightly differently because the laws are different, the populations are different, the ethnic groups have some differences as well. So, for example, Wyoming only has about 100,000 women of reproductive age, and we serve them by supporting their travel to our locations that are just below the Wyoming, Colorado border. Um, New Mexico has a lot of folks who are very, very rural. We are increasingly providing telehealth services for those people where we've instituted telehealth across our four state. Well, not quite in, in Wyoming yet um, because of some law problems um, and some restrictions there. But the other three states were very robust with telehealth for all of our services, including telehealth medication abortion. It does require a lot of interesting organization to do that. And so, for example, since COVID happened and we all very quickly jumped into telehealth, we have, rather than constructing a new um, brick and mortar facility, we have created a virtual care center where nurse practitioners, the health center assistants, the manager, everybody is remote and they are providing services across the region. We're going to come back to the telehealth uh, approach because I, I, I think that's that's enormously interesting, uh, particularly when you do, when when talking about reaching uh, new constituents. Mm -hmm. But uh, Melissa, let's let's move over to uh, Pennsylvania. You have 
less of a diversity in terms of, of circumstance and geography and so on. You're, you're more concentrated, but still this, this area of Eastern and Central Pennsylvania is, is a very interesting area, right? You have a lot of different attitudes. You have a lot of different uh, regions. Uh, talk about how you're organized and also um, uh, in terms of uh, the services that you provide, are the services pretty much identical from Planned Parenthood to Planned Parenthood to Planned Parenthood, or are there unique flavors of services that need to be offered in different areas? Well, thank you for the question, Mark, and for including me today. So yes, I, I serve um, just 37 counties in Eastern and Central Pennsylvania. They are primarily rural communities, however, with very limited access to public transportation. Um, it's a rather conservative area of Pennsylvania, but regardless of political or religious affiliation, what we know is that people still need high quality, low cost, um, non-judgmental sexual and reproductive health care. And so we've been serving this area of Pennsylvania for over 90 years. Um, you asked about sort of different flavors and different service mix. Certainly some of our sister affiliates provide um, primary care or limited primary care. We do have sort of a set menu that all Planned Parenthoods um, provide care in a, in a comprehensive range of sexual and reproductive health, including abortion to contraceptive care to the STI testing and treatment and so on. But some affiliates have expanded further out to offer uh, some limited primary care. So just for uh, full disclosure, when I was a, 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 a very young man, uh, totally in love, um, I benefited from services from uh, Planned Parenthood. I went to a Planned Parenthood office. I didn't know uh, beans about um, birth control or, or proper conduct or, or whatever. Um, and a very bored African-American woman uh, 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 sat this uh, young white guy, well-intentioned down and, um, and educated him. Um, and it was, it was a really important experience. I didn't want to go to my parents. I didn't know who to go to. My my friends were as clueless as me, um, and so um, I, I sat there and I and I was educated. Walked out of the the office and uh, and was was very uh, thoughtful. I suppose those kinds of conversations transpire day after day, uh, year after year, uh, to people who really are are think, trying to think this through. Where else can they go if it isn't Planned Parenthood? Um, Jennifer, uh, and I'm really asking, uh, so if, 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 if I was me today, <laughs> and if it wasn't Planned Parenthood, where would I go? Well, Mark, let's start with what you would get at Planned Parenthood and the, all the different ways that we might come to you for that sex education. One of the things that I know we've all done during the pandemic is turn to the internet. And so young people can get information online through Planned Parenthood about sexual and reproductive health. You could have had your questions answered just with, just with what we have available online. Or you could have had a chat conversation with a chat bot to, to have a text conversation and ask your questions in, in a way that so many young people are accustomed to communicating now. The other thing that we're doing is we're doing virtual classrooms so that if you didn't want to go into a place in your community, you could have found a classroom, again, online and been with other young people. And we're really careful to make sure that our sex educators are young folks or younger folks. Certainly, you're not going to have any gray haired ladies like me teaching sex ed at Planned Parenthood. And we're going to make sure that that it's people that young folks want to listen to and and can really hear and, and they know how to talk about these things so i don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about the range of ways that young folks can get the information that they need right now from planned parenthood and the other thing that we're doing i can say in a state like illinois we are right now trying to pass a law that requires personal health and safety education in schools. 
so that all young people can get some level of education in schools where they already are, where they already have trusted adults that they listen to. So we're really hoping that if you don't make it to Planned Parenthood, there are lots of ways that young folks can learn about sexual and reproductive health. That's so interesting. So in addition to the in-person uh, visit, you can use uh, uh, these kinds of uh, vehicles. You can yeah. use your cell phone, I guess, uh, social media. You can, you can take courses online. None of that was afforded to us um, you know, when, I was, when I was very young. Um, and, and you mentioned some of the laws here, Jennifer, and, and Vicki actually also referred to laws. I'd like to uh, toss this over to you, Vicki, since you have to deal with so many different laws. Could you talk about this, this patchwork that we have in the United States? Because I think uh, quite different from uh, many other uh, nations, uh, we have so many different intersecting legal systems, right? We have the federal uh, legal, uh, we have federal law, we have state law, we have even local municipalities have, have different ordinances and laws. Um, how, do you, how do we navigate uh, this complexity? Can you just sort of describe a little bit about what you experience in your region? It's a vast territory, different, four different states, as you say, and you, you have to shape your services according to what is legal in each of those states. You're absolutely right. And so let me pick up from what Jennifer's been talking about, uh, sex education across the country, but particularly in Western states. So our four states, there's a strong local control for anything related to schools. So we are literally working, we, we have a state board of education in three of our four states, but they don't actually, are they're not able to tell schools we will do this sex education. We were successful at passing in Colorado a requirement that says if you if you provide sex education in a school, it must be comprehensive, it must be medically accurate and age appropriate. And of course our services fit exactly in there. So what what we are doing across each of these areas and this is not unique to Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains. We're all facing, as you say, jurisdictions that will make decisions for their very localized people. And sometimes those are very detrimental. We've seen a couple of um, cities just recently, Lubbock, Texas, declared itself to be an abortion-free zone. So abortion is, quote, not allowed in Lubbock. That law passed by the city council. It hasn't been put into effect yet, um, but that is the kind of thing that we're seeing. You'll see um, we fought a ballot initiative in Albuquerque. Never imagined that a city would have a ballot initiative that would prevent abortion services, but it did. And we had to mobilize a great number of partners, work really closely with a strong, strong group of reproductive justice partners. And we beat that law as well in Albuquerque or beat that um, citizen petition. So they pop up, these kinds of restrictions pop up in a variety of ways, very, very um, locally based, locally focused. And then of course we have the states um, as you've seen in the last couple of years, more anti-reproductive health care, anti-abortion laws have been introduced and passed in the last couple of years than we've ever seen. And there is, you called it a, a patchwork. There is a patchwork across the, the country of different um, requirements, different restrictions, and if you are a young person trying to sort your life out, you may not understand what is available in your state, even though Colorado and New Mexico and Nevada are very, very safe places for reproductive health care, particularly abortion care. Um, we're getting questions from patients saying, I think abortion is illegal now, right? Because they're hearing about all these laws that are passing. So um, I think our, you know, I don't think our citizenry is being helped by this, uh, by this widespread country. and confusing attempt to restrict these services. Melissa, what proportion of your spending is related to uh, abortion? I would say about, 10% of our spending is related to abortion care. 
the majority of our patients um, pay out of pocket their personal funds um, to receive that care because um, under restrictions, federal law and state law, uh, many um, public funding or commercial insurance companies no longer cover abortion care, unfortunately. So sadly, for uh, people without means, it can it can be very difficult to access, even if it is, um, even if there is a health center providing abortion down the road. And so we also have funds available um, from generous donors to help people who are pregnant um, cover the cost of abortion if they need that. And I also wanted to just say, um, just to talk about policy for just another second. Just this week in Pennsylvania, three abortion bans were passed out of our House Health Committee to that uh, will be voted on in the Pennsylvania House week after next. And we'll, and we'll get through the Pennsylvania legislature. Luckily, our governor will veto those three bans. But as Vicki stated, we are seeing an unprecedented number of state legislators, legislatures introducing and passing laws to restrict abortion care right now. So if, if abortion is 10% is of your services or even less, um, and uh, if there is such opposition to abortion, uh, why is it important to uh, to fight this battle for Planned Parenthood? Could you comment on this, um, to, uh, Jennifer? I'd like to start. Let's lay some basic groundwork on this issue. More than two thirds of people in the United States, in poll after poll, even polls done by conservative media outlets and conservative politicians, say that Americans support people having access to abortion. So I feel like what you're seeing in this, in this endless patchwork that my colleagues are talking about is um, a tyranny of the minority who are a smaller number of people are passing laws after laws that influence a broad swath of our country when the majority of people in our country do in fact support access to abortion. Here at Planned Parenthood of Illinois, and I think as Melissa called us, our sister affiliates, we feel the same. We are unapologetic about providing abortion because that is one of the services that our patients need and want. It is safe and it is legal and we are unapologetic about providing it. And, and when the Supreme Court, as it's now poised to gut or overturn access to abortion, it will just make it that much more difficult for patients to get the care that they need and that most people support them having. So it, it, is, it is so difficult the way that politicians have weaponized this one piece of medical care. And make no mistake about it, abortion is healthcare. And it's just one way that people can take care of their personal health. And we really, we need to try and continue to remind the public that it has overwhelming support. Is this really about um, me telling you what you're allowed to do? Me telling you what you're allowed to do. You, you can or cannot do something according to my desire and not according to yours. Is, is that really what's going on here, uh, Vicki, when, when you look at these, uh, these legislative efforts? Because when, when your behavior is restricted based on a law that I ensure is passed, it's really about preventing you from doing something that you would want to do and also preventing somebody from allowing, from providing the service that you would want. So they're voluntarily providing it. You're voluntarily asking for it. And I'm saying, no, you can't do that. You put your finger on it, I That's believe. It's not about my behavior. I don't have to have an abortion, right? Yeah. And I think when we look at who is pursuing these restrictions, they generally are not folks that are going to be affected by those restrictions. You're exactly right. The, what we know is that these attacks on sexual and reproductive health care disproportionately harm communities of color and people with low incomes. In my area, it's the rural folk who don't have access and don't have the wherewithal 
to make it across the state to um, services. So it's it's institutionalizing, it is perpetuating an unequal playing field for people. And let's be honest, it is about women. Now we have had Roe in place for 50 years. Um, several generations have come of age with Roe as a, a guarantee. And that means that as a young person, you can plan your college education. As a young mother, you can plan how many children you're going to have and you can get about your life. And now a group of people are coming in and saying, no, no, you have to live your life according to my plan. Um, this is above and beyond, this is unfair. And we consequently, Planned Parenthood, because we serve these folks, these are our patients and they tell us what they need. So we, as Jennifer says, are not only unapologetic, we're fiercely defending these um, rights and this access. So well, that's an interesting, interesting point that you make about uh, who this affects. So it, it begs the, the question as to who is passing the laws because mm -hmm. if, if the people who it affects are not the people who are passing the laws, then I am passing a law to affect somebody who doesn't look like me, who doesn't live like me, who doesn't have the same income that I, that I have, right? Is, is that what's going on? Is this really an exercise of control and power over uh, the conduct of people who are not like me, but I want them to behave in certain ways? Um, you know, I mean, part of this is it, it's it, it's ethnic, uh, it's ethic, uh, uh, ethically driven. People have a real strong view um, that uh, abortion uh, equates to murder. And you can understand that ethical view, but part of this seems to also be an exercise in power, um, in 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 requiring people to behave who are not like me, according to my lights. Uh, Melissa, how do you see it? I, I agree wholeheartedly that the efforts to um, interfere with people's personal medical decision is an, an effort to uh, control women's bodies and women's lives. So there's no doubt that when women had access to safe and legal abortion and uh, contraceptive care, that we made huge gains in education, in our wealth, in uh, legislatures and politics across the country. And um, there's no doubt that people find that threatening. Now, I certainly understand when people have deeply held religious beliefs that are contrary to abortion. However, I do draw the line when they in, impose their personal belief and decision making on other people's bodies. And that's really um, where I feel like we have to draw the line. So if I'm, if I'm a Muslim and somebody is Catholic and we have two different belief systems, do they get to decide what my moral compass is, I guess? Um, if somebody is Catholic and I'm Jewish, do I get to decide what their moral compass is? Is that, is that your point? That's my point exactly. It's when decisions regarding my own health care, my bodily autonomy um, should stay fundamentally with myself in consultation with the people that I trust, my medical uh, providers and so on. And that your opinions and your deeply held religious beliefs should not interfere with my bodily autonomy. So there's a, there are a couple of arguments here that are interesting, right? There's a libertarian argument that can be made for not imposing laws that affect somebody else's, that restrict somebody else's liberty. There's also a religious freedom argument that can be made uh, here when it, when it comes to these kinds of, of issues. What other arguments can be made in terms of, you know, Planned Parenthood started as a way, uh, it, was a, it was a way for women to, uh, to take control of their own reproductive health. Is there also a public health argument that can be made, Jennifer? Absolutely. Planned Parenthoods all over the country are an important part of the public health community. And most of us are an important part of the public health safety net. Like Vicki has already said, we have a specialty in serving people who don't have access to other care. 
And so we are out there trying to make sure that people that live in rural communities or LGBT communities, communities of color, have the same access to care as everyone else. That's a big part of it. And, and Mark, I just want to go back a little bit to the, to the protecting one's personal choices. And it's interesting to me that there are conservative politicians in the U United States Congress right now who complain about being forced to wear a mask which protects everybody's health and safety right now during the global pandemic. But those people have no problem writing increasingly conservative laws that restrict a person with a uterus's ability to have or not have access to care. So they understand autonomy when it relates to their ability to wear a small piece of cloth on their face, but they forget about bodily autonomy when it comes to access to abortion. So part of this is just really about power. Um, oh, yeah. It's not about consistency. It's not about analysis. Mm -hmm. It's about power mm -hmm. um, and, and which side has power. So how do we get outside of this uh, power dynamic? Uh, because it seems that um, if you talk about civil society, if we dissipate our energy struggling over power, we end up weakening ourselves. I don't think we can afford to, to, uh, to be weak. Is there a way, and have you, uh, have you been able to reach out to people who might have different views on the ethical basis, uh, but can find some sort of an acceptance based on things like uh, principles of religious uh, freedom, the whole idea that that we shouldn't have um, coercive laws to force behaviors if we can avoid it. Um, have you been able to systematically reach out to members of your community who might have a different view of yours, but engage in a dialogue that is respectful and not is yelling at each other? Uh, Vicki, how, how, how does this unfold in, in your region? There's a Th that's an important theme, and we have to have a little bit of a historical context as we think about it. Planned Parenthood has had, again, we're 105 years old, specifically Colorado um, Planned Parenthood started 105 years ago. Across those years, we had many, many, many Republicans as part of our organization, Republican board members, Republican donors. And if you what has happened in the last, well, maybe since Reagan, but in the last 20 years at least, and certainly in the last five or six, the dialogue has gotten very toxic. And consequently, we don't have very many Republicans engaged with us anymore. Um, not because the people have changed out. In fact, people have left that party. They're still involved with us. So the dynamic is evolving. The, the thing I would point out, we, we raised the question a few minutes ago, what percentage of effort goes into abortion services and abortion care as opposed to our other care? And for most of it, it's about 10%. It's about but what we know is when we invest in contraception, when we invest in education, when we invest in STI testing and treatment, that raises the health and the well-being of people and we have incredible data that shows um, two things. Uh, those investments save public dollars, but maybe more importantly to this particular part of our conversation, abortion rates go down. People don't get pregnant when they have birth control. It's a really simple equation. And so if these folks that don't want abortion to occur really meant that, and it wasn't about power, investments in contraception, investments in women's health would make all the difference. And we could stop arguing about abortion. So Melissa, we're coming to the end of our time. So we're gonna give you the last word. Um, and I think it's really important to have the smallest of the, of the Planned Parenthood organizations that we're, we're looking at right now have the last word, because I think that there's, there's too much emphasis in this country on uh, the centers of power, which are very often urban areas, um, and and the you know the coastal elites and all this other stuff. Um, when when you're talking about serving your constituents and then broadening it out to every American, what do you think is important going into the future in terms of this 
uh, service that you provide? How do you see it developing um, over the next several years? Well, I think that's one of the most exciting things I think about every day is how to better serve our community um, through in increased opportunities through telemedicine, I think is one of the best ways because as I mentioned earlier, we serve a very rural population. I can't even imagine Vicki's affiliate serving Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, and how limited access can be between um, you know, centers of cities and uh, large demographic populations. So that pushing as much care through telemedicine, I think is important, really increasing the benefits under the Affordable Care Act so that more people have access to um, healthcare, increasing Medicaid coverage and the Medicaid expansion in the states that haven't expanded, I think is absolutely essential. So many people have lost jobs and um, lost access to health insurance through the pandemic. And uh, we have really seen an increase in people who um, have very, very uh, limited abilities to pay for their health care. So those are a lot of the ways that I'm, I'm thinking about the future and our delivery of meeting patients where they are to deliver the care they need no matter what. So trying to ensure that you provide this, uh, this combination that Jennifer referred to of telemedicine, um, uh, telecounseling, yes. um, the, the online resources, um, and then the in-person um, services. There are so many other topics that we could discuss, but I'd really like to thank you all for helping us to navigate these, these complex issues. Jennifer Welsh, President and CEO of Planned Parenthood of Illinois, Vicki uh, Cord, uh, President and CEO of Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains, and Melissa Reed, President and CEO of Planned Parenthood of Keystone. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for uh, helping us to navigate this, this topic. Uh, attendees, thank you for for uh, visiting with us and we'll see you on Tuesday. Mm -hmm.